Okay, this is now being recorded. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, where does he post these? He posts these. Um, it's in my web downloads folder. When you go to the internet, um, you go to my homepage, which is listed at the top of the class syllabus. There's a link file for download. That link is also in Canvas on the front page. And that takes you to a site which has all these folders, assuming internet works. Okay, you go to Computer 129, and then you have lecture notes, which is where all this stuff goes. And you have homework, which is where homework assignments go, including solutions when the time is, is right for that. Did I just lose my Canvas page? Does it still work? Good, it still works. Um, all right. So that's where that stuff goes. Get out of, get it from that, that download stuff link. Um, so I, oh yeah, I was looking at the picture. Okay, so when A is running, the top of the stack has to be along this, this line here. A can refer to any of its variables, its parameters, its everything, because it will remember those as an offset from the top of the stack. Jumping ahead, when B is running, the top of the stack is here. And B says, okay, if I want to get at the local variable X, we know from the top of the stack how, how far down the stack X is. We have a table. We're going to build that table today. And so um, return address, nobody needs to know where that is. The um, parameters, B needs to know where they can be found. The return value, B needs to be able to return, so it needs to know where that is. So all of these locations except the return address, B is gonna have a table that says, these are where they are. When I'm running, I can find them. Um, what these are for is, it's, it's with respect to B, it's a B table. But it says, if anybody calls me, in this case A, but if anybody calls me, when they're running and this is their top of the stack, how do they get at the return value and the parameters? Because they're gonna need to do that. When A is running, it's going to access its own data using offset from the top of the stack. And it's going to get values. It's going to do calculations, whatever. It's going to get the values of these parameters. And it's going to use the link upwards to place those parameters effectively above the top of the stack. That's A's job before it calls B is fill B's parameters. When B is done with that, now, what about the return value? You just leave that spot empty. OK, when A is running, it's not moving the top of the stack. It's not making space. It just says, you know what? The, the, the last parameter in this list is going to be a byte or two above this location. A doesn't know that. It's going to be in a table that B provides. There's one table for how does B access its own stuff and one table for whoever calls B, what do they need to access, which is just parameters and later the return value. So we're going to have these two tables. You're going to see, we're going to build those. Um, okay, so every function, A has a two, but I'm focusing on B here. Every function has two tables in effect. One, how it accesses its stuff, and the other, how anybody who calls it needs to access stuff before and after the call. Um, basic procedure, if A wants to call B, first thing it does is load parameters for B using this table of offsets. They have to be offsets because the top of the stack can be anywhere when A is running. Depends on who called who before A was called. And so everything is in terms of an offset from the top of the stack. If we go back and look at our, um, our table here, memory access modes. We've talked about immediate and direct. Indirect is pointers, which we're probably not going to mess with too much directly, no pun. Uh, stack relative is the important one. Okay, stack relative says whatever the operand of this instruction is that is using stack relative reference. If I say stack relative, if I say direct five, then I'm going to location five in memory to get data. If I say immediate five, I get a five. Direct, go to location five. Indirect, go to the location of like, like a direct access, take the value there and go somewhere else as, a, as, a, as an address. We're not messing with pointers. 
stack relative says take the value of the operand and add it to the top of stack and that's where we're going to look in direct mode so it's relative to the stack at any given point now virtually all of our programs everything is stack relative the only thing in your program that is not stack relative is if you have global variables global variables are evil don't do that but um so anyway, yeah, we're gonna have these tables, we're gonna build them up. A puts the parameters up there for B. Then A needs to move the stack top of stack pointer up to that limit. Okay, basically it has to move the stack past the stuff that it had to deal with. Once A does that, then A calls B. The call command is gonna take the stack pointer, which, excuse me, it's gonna take the program counter. Somewhere in A, code is running. And when we're done with B, we have to come back to there. So we have to take the program counter at that position and store it somewhere to find our way back. That goes here in the return address. Okay, that happens because A called B, that call command over there. So A calls B, A's program counter goes up into there. The new program counter value is, I, I don't have anywhere to point at it here. It's the beginning of B's code. So B starts running. First thing B does is it says, okay, now the, the top of the stack bumped up one. The call command does that. It's automatic. So you'll notice I said the stack offset here is what A does, it's red. A, A moves the stack up there when, when it's, it's uh, getting ready to call B. During the call, a single integer is added at the stack and the stack pointer moves up. That's just part of what the hard, hardware does. And then B's job, the stack offset over here, first thing B does is it moves the stack pointer up again to make room for local variables. Once B has done that, um, it can then use its table to access the local variables and the parameters and the return value at the end of B when it returns a value. And so it, it you know, everything B is working is with the top of stack up here. When B is finished, we reverse this process. Okay, B is going to, first of all, if there's a return value, it's going to place it down here. That's just getting the return ready. And then B is going to reverse the stack offset. The first command in B will be to make room, for, to move the stack up and make room for the local variables. The last command of B before returning is to move the stack right back where it found it. Everybody's job is to put the stack back the way they found it, wherever it was. So B found the top of stack right here. When B started, it moved the stack up did its work when it finished and moved it back down to here. It left the top where it found it. Okay. B then executes its final command returned from subroutine. That command will look at the top of the stack. It's built to do that. There's no choice. It will look at the top of the stack. It will place that value back into the program counter, meaning that that address is the next address which, we, which will be executed. We will begin executing down in A again, wherever we came from. And it will remove the top of the stack down. That's all what the, ter what the return from subroutine does. Call subroutine, adds program counter onto the stack, and then sets the program counter to the beginning of B's code. The return command takes that value off the stack, places it into the program counter, and the next instruction executes out of A, wherever it came from. So A stack offset right before it calls B is this. As Soon as B gets going, it adds this stuff, and then it can work. When B is finished, it puts the top back where it found it, executes the return, and the first thing A must do is set the top of stack back to where it expects it to be. A can't do anything unless the top of the stack is in the right place. So if you look at A's code, we're gonna see one line, move the stack pointer up, second line, call B, and then the third line in A's code you get to when B is all finished is put the top stop of the stack back. Three lines, move it up, call B, move it back. And then A can execute again with the top of stack being where it needs to be for A. So this is our structure. Any questions on the lines and colors and stuff, I guess. <laughs> Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna write a very small assembly program that um, does this. It's gonna, it's gonna accomplish a function call. Nothing. 
Maybe you're typing. I don't know. There have to be little things on this thing that say he's typing right now or something. Somebody's typing. Okay. So we're going to move on. Um, I'm going to open up a uh, text box, I think, is what I'm going to use. So um, where shall I put it? I'll put it under, not web downloads. I'll put it directly in uh, lecture notes. So there will also be a text document. Um, new text, lecture notes. O three twenty six. Okay, so the PDF is this picture. The lecture notes is the actual machine code we're going to write in assembly. So, um, this stuff basically, when I'm done with it, we should be able to copy it, stuff it right into the first box on um, in the simulator, and it should compile and do something. So here's the program I'm going to do. Anything following a semicolon in the simulator is a comment at the assembly level. So to be compiled um, int foo int a char b. Oops, I gotta have semicolons on these. All this is is comment. Int x local variable. Um, x equals a plus three, return x. So we're basically handling parameters, we're handling a local variable, we're doing a little math in between using the variables, and then we're gonna do a return. All the basic mechanism. Um, void main, void. Uh, somebody pointed out to me that actually, if you uh, put void here, the, C the uh, Visual Studio compiler won't even accept it. They say it has to be main. I don't know if I ever checked that to make sure it's actually true. Um, technically, main should return an int. I just don't want to deal with return values on main. I want to sort of pretend that one is, is kind of all by itself. So um, if we we're translating a C++ program, we may have an issue with this. Let's see, what do I want main to do? I want two local variables, int, I'm doing all ints here. Char would be one byte, int is two bytes. Other than that, they're basically just bytes. Int x, or excuse me, int y and z. Um, z equals one. Y equals foo z and the character star. The out y. Okay, so that's why I want to. What I want to. Um, what is the pur purpose of the character reference? I don't have a character reference in here. I'm not too sure what you're talking about. You mean the the character literal or the character parameter? Please clarify. Parameter, this one here, info, okay. Um, it's there just to show you how to do a parameter. <laughs> okay, this program doesn't do anything useful. <laughs> okay, um, to make it do something useful is making a bigger program. And right now, I just wanna focus on this function call thing. I just wanna see it happen. I wanna have more than one parameter, so you see how more than one parameter is handled. I have more than one local variable here. Uh, you could have zero local variables, you can have zero parameters, but I just want to give you a couple of different versions of the same idea to see it all work. Okay, so, um, anyway, here is the assembly. Now, normally, the command here would be the first command that's going to get executed that would be stuff inside of main. Um, I am gonna treat main as a function though, completely. So, <clears throat> um, 
that's one aspect. Another thing that I want to do is I don't want all of my function code to be mixed up in different places. Basically, if I put the function code here, the data ends up at the end, which is okay, and, and then the assembler will handle it. But at this point in the text, I'm doing this because the text does it. At this point in the text, they stop putting instructions first and memory second. They do it the opposite way. So basically, main is gonna be down somewhere below. What I'm gonna have here is simply call main, and I'm gonna capitalize my function names. That's gonna go somewhere, I'm waving my hands again, sorry. Way down here, there's gonna be a main. And that's where the code for main is gonna go. I'll fill that in. Okay, after main has been called and it comes back, because we know that's what happens when you call a function, you come back to where the next line. When it comes back, I'm done with my program because main was the, the main function. So I'll have stop. So that's just kind of the header to my program. It allows me to put stuff up here before I get to function calls. Uh, it allows me to have global variables up here, uh, other possibilities. It cleans up a lot of kind of fussy issues. Okay, so stop. What I want to do is generate this code in the order you see it here. Okay, I'm going to do it like a C compiler does it and try to do this in a one pass um, collecting data as I go. Okay, the C compiler does it. Some compilers go through twice. The assembler that we're using for, um, for the PEP8 actually does one pass through counting bytes and noting the values of those symbols or labels. Symbols is what they call them. Uh, so it does one pass doing that. Then it does a second pass um, translating the assembly into machine code and filling in the values of these symbols. So um, I'm going to try and do it with a, a single pass, just reading through this and writing as, and filling in as I go. The C compiler can do it. I hope I can. Okay, so first thing I see, I've, I've dealt with, you know, somewhere main gets called. That's got to be the first instruction because the PEP8 starts at instruction zero. That is not negotiable. So that part's done. Um, I have a comment here. Here is the function prototype and local variables or foo. Okay, that's my foo function. Um, I'm gonna copy the code up here as I go. In fact, let's just copy it right now. Again, um, I'm not sure where that main is gonna come into it here. That'll happen somewhere right around here, I think. I'm going to take this and translate as I go. So basically, I have the prototype for foo, I have the beginning of it, and I have local parameters. I am assuming for this purpose that local parameters are listed first. Uh, the C compiler parameters have to be listed at the top of the block, which means that I can have a block inside with more local parameters. Um, how does a compiler actually do that? I would bet money that the compiler actually looks through the entire function, lists all the parameters are there, and, and sets them up ahead of time. Um, I know for a fact that C++ does that. If I declare a class object here and another class object later on down here somewhere, um, construction happens. Construction may happen here, but the object exists up there. If you go into the debugger and things, you can find that stuff out. So anyway, back to my picture of the tables. If A is going to call B, uh, if main is going to call foo, main needs to know what the parameters are, where they are, how to access them from the top of stack as main is running. So um, we need to make a table for this. As a result of these lines here, I have the following. Um, caller table of stuff calling foo, which is parameters. Um, actually, I guess it really doesn't need the index, does it? Well, I want to handle all of the calling and not calling stuff up front. So that includes that. 
B's end of this is going to be that. What does a caller need to access? The caller needs to access the um, parameters for um, foo. Now, again, back to this picture. Foo returns an integer. So there's going to be one integer there. That's two bytes. How many parameters do we have? We have two. I'm going to stack them in the order they occur here, which means that A goes first and B goes second. Okay. Um, stack for foo is going to be uh, top. Um, it's going to have, what did I say comes next? Locals, okay. Locals, which in this case is just X. Actually, this stuff should go after that. So the stack for foo is gonna be the top of the stack. Locals, which is X. And then um, return value. And then um, the return address. I'm sorry, return address. Parameters. Return value. So these are the locations that Foo is going to be involved with. They're all the locations on this top part here. Now, which ones does main need to execute? I'm talking about the caller. Who is calling Foo? Okay, it is a Foo table, but there's one table for the people that call Foo, and there's one table for when Foo is running. The caller table are these values. B, B's running stuff, Foo's running stuff are these values. Okay. I need access to the parameters, that is A and B. Now if we count bytes, A, and we have two bytes here for the return value because it returns an integer and that's two bytes. So I gotta go one, two, see one goes to the second byte of that, two goes to the third byte. I need to go minus three to get to the first byte here. What is A? A is an integer, I think. It is. So actually, A is going to be another byte up from there. Um, A equals, how many bytes up was that from the top of the stack? One to there, two to there, three to the bottom of A, four. Okay, so A is four. Okay, that's a little confusing. I have function A over here, sorry about that. Um, parameters, that's the parameter inside foo. Um, when A is running, top of stack, one, two, three, four, we're looking at the first byte of the last parameter in the list, the first one that is added to the stack. So that is where A needs to be. The way I do that down here in my table, is going to be like this. Um, foo color stack adjust. Um, I'm going to write them in the order that I did it here actually. Um, foo color adjust. I'm going to write them all down and then we'll we'll deal with them. Um, foo color B. I can write. Um, foo color return value. Okay, let's do these one at a time. So the first thing that I find up from the bottom of the stack is A.
Okay, so where is A? It is negative four from the top of the stack. So I'm going to say Foucault adjust, um, that is a symbol. Equate. Okay, um, I did them in the opposite order. I put B on the stack first in my notes. Well, let's do it this way, whatever. See if I can get it right. Equate um, four or negative four. So what does this do? I've created a symbol. Normally this symbol would be the line number, the, the memory address number of where this instruction is, but the equate command says, no, just put a negative four in that symbol. So foo's caller adjust is, I'm sorry, foo caller a. When the, when the caller of foo tries to access a, it's negative four. When, when main tries to access the parameter a, which I put first on the stack going upwards, it's gonna have an offset of negative four to get to that value. B would be the next one. Okay, when the caller is, call, is looking for the B parameter to fill it in, now that second parameter is just a character, so if A starts at negative four, this one starts at negative five. It's above it on the stack, okay? Let's sort of fill this in a little bit. Callers uh, stack offset to access um, foos parameter A. Make this a little long. Okay, when the caller wants to fill in the parameter B, Let's copy all this. B. Now this is all, if we go back and look at the code, when main calls foo, it's passing z, which is an integer in as the first parameter and it's passing a character star in as the second. Main needs to put z above the top of the stack and it needs to put the star above that, sticking these things into the stack. So main is the caller, it's the one doing the calling, it's calling foo, and it's gonna do um, those two things, and these are the offsets of where those things are gonna go. Okay, the two things I have other than that, the return value, let's do that one next. Oops, shoot. Oh, I got an extra space there. I know I was doing something wrong. Okay, um, equate, stop that, nice, there we go. Okay, when A is running, top of stack is here, when the caller is running, I should say, and the return value, it's two bytes, because it's an integer in this case, and so a top of stack minus two is gonna hit that return value. So for the caller to get the return value is a minus two. Now this happens after foo has been called and it has returned. And when we get back to a running or main running, um, it needs to grab that return value and get it back. And that return value is gonna be right above the top of the stack with respect to the way main or a sees it. Okay, so this is the Stop that. The caller stack offset to access foo's return value. So we got our parameters, we got our return value. There's one more thing that has to happen, and that is when A is getting ready to call B, so A starts out by putting all the parameters up where they need to be. Then before it calls B, it has to move the top of the stack to the top of this parameter list and then the call itself will add one more and then B will add the rest. And so 
A needs to move the top of the stack up over the return value and the parameters. It's the sum of that distance is what it needs to do. Um, and in my notes, I have a five. That is not an, it's, that's not an offset. Let me, let me comment this and then. Stack adjust by the collar before and after the call covers return value and parameters. Okay, I am going to get rid of word wrap here. And I'll let those run a little bit long. So A fills the parameters. Right before it calls B, it needs to move the stack up that much. Now the top parameter was uh, B at negative five. So there's two bytes here, two bytes for A, three bytes or one byte for the character, there are a total of five bytes. So the stack adjust is five. I think it'll be the positive of the top parameter always. That just occurred to me for the first time ever. That kind of makes sense. Whatever the top parameter is, um, that is the distance from the, that A has to put onto the stack. So those are the things that A needs to know when it's calling B. Now, when B gets called, another table, foo table, or when it's running. Okay, first thing foo has to do, well, okay, we can do this two ways. We can say, what is the order that it does? And we can say, what um, things does that access? Let's do the same order I did up here, kind of. What things does foo access? It needs to access its local variables. And so, um, see, foo had a local variable, what was it? X. Okay, so I will have a, no, a foo X. Okay, now notice the difference. Foo caller A is how A is accessed by the one who calls foo. It's an upwards access to something above. That's only parameters and return value. Um, X is not a caller's X, it's Foo's X. When Foo is running in the top of stack is here, where is X? It's somewhere down here. And that's what I'm looking for now. Okay, I only have one local variable. There's only one local variable here, and it's gonna be right at the top of the stack. So Foo X, um, the offset for that equate zero. Whose uh, uh, stack offset to access local variable X. So anytime when foo is running, that tells it where it can find X relative to the top of the stack as foo runs. Um, foo has, let's see, so what happens? That's the local variables. There's a return address, which nobody accesses that except the hardware. The next thing are the parameters. Now I put in A first and then B. So B is, is the next one up here. Foo B equate. Okay, how many bytes from the top of the stack? Um, two bytes and we hit the return address. Two bytes more and we hit the first parameter. Okay, because there's only one integer in local variable. So two passes that, two passes the return address. So it should be uh, four. Foo stack offset to access parameter B. Okay, where is the next parameter A? Foo A equate. Um, that's just a byte down from B, so that's going to be five. Four plus five. Um, foo's stack offset to access 
parameter a. And finally, when foo is finished running, it needs to access that return value down here. And so let's put that one in, foo, oops, foo return value, equate. Okay, so where's that gonna be? A is at five, um, A has two bytes in it. So going to seven, I hit the return value. Foo's access, or stack offset for its return value. At the end of Foo's running, it's going to place a value into that right before it shuts down and passes control back to A or main, take your pick. Um, I should have put like um, foo and main here just to clarify that. Maybe I'll, oh, we'll see. Okay, so there's almost my full tables. I got one more. When A calls B, it puts the parameters in, it moves the top of the stack up, A's stack adjust. As soon as B is done, A has to back that off again. When B starts, the stack up top of stack is right here at the top of return address. When B starts, it has to add enough memory for local variables, that's its stack adjust. And when it's finished, it has to take that back off the stack. So foo stack adjust. Equate. Okay, I only had the one local variable, that's two bytes. Foo stack it adjust for local variable x for local for all local variables, which is x in this case. Um, stack adjust by color, which covers return value and parameters. Okay, so I had that one up there that way. Okay. I need to emphasize that if I'm writing a program in C, the compiler is reading this stuff, and a later chapter we're gonna talk a little bit, just a tiny bit, about how the compiler actually reads these characters and determines something about the language structure it needs to produce. We're gonna talk just a little tiny bit about that. But once the compiler has figured out the structure, there's a function call, its name is foo, it returns an int, it's got two parameters, and then a char, it's got a local variable, okay. Once it has understood that, then it actually generates this stuff in the assembler code. Okay, the compiler's producing this stuff, it's building its own tables. Um, I only have to do this once. Anytime foo is running, this table is gonna be used. Anytime anybody calls foo, this table is going to be used. And every time I hit the prototype or the header of a function, we're going to do that. The only other function I have here is main, and it's got um, no parameters, no return value as I chose to do it, and two local variables. So we'll build that table as well, but not right now. Okay, the header for foo, including local variables, the tables that result from it. Questions? Hi. Why are those first values negative? Okay. Um, these ones up here. These are when main or A is running. And so main is running. The top of the stack is right here. And while main is running, let's go back and look at the code. So while main is running, in this is all main's code. It has to be run under main's environment or context. So while main is running, I have this command. It says take the value z, which is why the top of the stack has to be the right place. Main's gonna have a table. What the heck? I don't know what just happened there. Um, main has to access its own z. It has to have the top of stack in the right place where main's table can find its local z properly. Okay, so top of stack is along this line. Um, main needs to take the value of z 
and then put it into the first parameter of foo. Where is that? Top of stack is here, the first parameter a inside of, of uh, foo is right there. And how far is that from the top of the stack? Whatever number this is, let's, let's say the top of stack is 10. Okay, minus nine, minus eight, we're at that top of stack, minus seven, minus six, that's where a is gonna be. Because this return value is two bytes and a has two bytes. So the minus is, it is the offset of the stack to find that value. Okay, the offset from the caller's perspective, all the parameters and return value are above the top of the stack, which is smaller addresses. Um, does the return address count as two? The return address is whatever the size that we're returning is. Up here, foo returns an integer. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Does the return address count as two? Yes, the return address is an address on the pet machine. The address is two bytes. It's always been that way. I don't understand what going from foo x to foo. Oh, from up here to down there. Yeah, you have to account for those two bytes in there. Again, nobody accesses that directly. Um, B or foo does not need an offset to it. Main or A does not need, not need an offset to it. Um, when main calls B, the hardware will place a value there and move the top of the stack up. When B executes the return command, the hardware will grab that value to restore location in main and move the top of the stack back down. Nobody actually uses that, but it's gotta go there because A needs to put the parameters in, so they've gotta come first before it calls it, and um, B is gonna put the local variables in after it is called. So this order is critical. Um, good, okay, let's move on. Okay, so we built these two tables, and that is a result of seeing these lines of code. Now we're gonna move on and see the next lines of code, which is x equals a plus three. This is b executing its first command. Oh, wait a minute, foo. Did I use capital? I did. Okay, so foo's code starts here, and eventually we will have a return command. Um, that's the assembly command for return. Is it RT zero? Yeah. Okay, so this is the foo stuff. And what's gonna go in there? When foo starts, the top of the stack is above the return address. We need to allocate stack space for the local variables, get the top of stack in the right place so foo's table will work in, in accessing things. So first step is adjust the stack. Um, add stack pointer, no, subtract stack pointer. Add. Okay, let me think about this for just a second. Um, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, subtract. Oh, the, this, yeah, the stack offset is a, is a positive value. Subtract stack pointer. That's one of our commands. And what I want to subtract is um, the stack offset that foo will do. When foo is first called, it needs to make room for its local variables. That's a two. It is uh, foo's stack adjust. It's this value right here. So let's subtract stack pointer, foo stack adjust, and that's immediate mode. Um, okay, comment. Make room on stack for local variables. First thing foo does, it finds the top of stack here. It makes room for local variables. It will then do its work. And when it's finished, right before it returns, it will remove that memory. So let's put that one in right now, right before the return zero. Um, add stack pointer, the same amount. Restore stack top to where we found it. Put it right back, undo this one up here. So foo, when it starts, make room for local variables, 
as it's finishing, get rid of that room, put the stack pointer back where it was, and then return. Go back to where we came from. Um, if we look at the commands, we'll see that there is return, RET. You can actually put any digit, I believe it is zero through nine here. Let's check that. Let's find the return command. Return N, um, ACK. Okay, well, N is three digits, so I can go from zero to seven there. Um, what that actually means is, okay, where did it go? So return zero says, do the return command. And in that process, um, decrement the top of the stack. Now the return is gonna take that one off, that's given. This says take off this many extra. So in this case, I could leave this one out and say return two, okay? This is, we were talking about short versus long um, instruction sets, okay? This is a long instruction. I could just say return and it would do what I've explained, but they actually have a variation on return. They had a few extra bits. And so they have special returns from, from zero to seven. And it says, take that many off the stack. This would say, take the local variables, variables off and then do the return. I would leave this out in that case. I want to see all the parts. I want to be aware of all the parts of what's happening. So I'm always going to do a return zero and pretend that isn't there. An optimizing compiler to make it a little tiny bit faster would take this one out and put that one in. Or would, would, would put the number there instead. Um, that only works if your local variable count is seven or smaller. If the number of bytes in your local variables is seven or smaller, you can do that. So it's not a general case. This this little thing. For functions with a small number of parameters, it might speed up your machine a tiny little bit. Um, tiny little bits count in real life. So that's kind of what that is. I'm gonna always stick with zero and see the parts. When you do something, you undo it. That's, that's the, the principle here. Anything a function does, it has to undo and leave things the way it found them. So foo found the top of stack here. Oops, okay, that doesn't work. Foo found the, wow. Stop it. Foo found the top of stack here. It moved it up to here, did its thing, and when it finished, it put it right back where it found it. And then the return is gonna take off what the call put in. Okay, so that's my basic structure of foo. First thing, get the stack ready, get the local variables ready. Last thing, clear that out, get rid of it. Subtract so stack pointer, moves the stack pointer up, add stack pointer, moves it down. So the stack adjust is always a positive value, how much needs to be changed, and we can do an add and a subtract on it. Okay, um, so I've already done the return X. I got ahead of myself here. Okay, so we have the A equals A plus three, then we have the return X and a function, which triggers that stuff. I haven't, fill, I haven't filled in this yet. So X equals A plus three. Thinking about the accumulator, things like that, I need to load A, add three, store it in X. So let's do those three steps. Um, L, D, A, load into the accumulator, not the index. Um, and now I want to put it into A. That is foo A, okay? It's five down from the top of the stack. When everything is said and done, a is going to be somewhere down in here. It is an offset of five from the top of the stack. So I'm going to say foo A. And all of these variables will always be stack relative. The only thing that is not stack relative is global variables. Load A from the parameters. Okay, everything is going to be stack relative from this point forward. Let's add three to it. Add a um, three. It's a literal value. I'll just make a, a literal thing here. Immediate mode. Load a from parameters into ACC just to be sure about that. The accumulator. There's a little confusion there too. A, a has so many meanings because when we talk about registers, A was the accumulator. 
Okay, so load the A, add the three. Now we want to store it in X. ST, is it STO? Oh, it's LDA and STA. Okay, LDA, STA. I want to store it in X. That is Foo's version of X. And of course, that is stack relative. Okay, so the X equals A plus three, turn it into that. Now return fired off this stuff. However, there's also the issue of what we're returning. And so before we mess with the stack, we're gonna grab X, LDA, uh, foo, X, stack relative, load X, and store it, foo, um, return value, stack relative, um, okay, so return X, it actually sort of does the right hand side first. That needs to be set up for the return, load the value. If you have math here, you do the math just like above but you eventually get the value you're gonna return, load, calculate, whatever, store it in the return value of foo, and then we're going to shut down. Okay, I still have to have the stack the normal way for this because I'm accessing X in the return value. Those constants are from the top of the stack. They're always relative to the top of the stack. So I, I, I have to change the top of the stack first thing when I start, and last thing when I quit so that everything else works properly. Okay, so that's the code for foo. Questions on that one? Okay, we're uh, probably a little bit more than halfway there now. <clears throat> Next thing we see is main, so we're going to create a main. As before, I'm going to sort of start with all of the variables. I'm going to build my tables. Okay, let's copy these because I'm lazy. All the foos become main. I'm sure there's an easier way to do this. Oh, wait a minute. Well, let's start with this. Okay, main does not have an A. What does main have? Um, it has an X and a Y. So let's make um, mains color It has no parameters. Comment. Main has no parameters, so no main color um, variables are there. Okay, main color return value. Um, Main has no return value because I want to make my life easy. So there is no main caller return value. Um, main caller stack adjust. Okay, now when main is called, it does need to set aside two integers. Okay, that is four. Oh wait, no, the color stack adjusts for parameters. Um, mains, main has no return or parameters. So color adjust is zero. That one's gotta be there because the, the code is gonna be written, um, equate, Zero. 
Again, you could say, okay, I have a really smart compiler that remembers what is and is not there. And in the colors code, it simply doesn't add zero. It just leaves off the stack of dust. I am, like I said before, I want to do everything a piece at a time and be aware of where they happen. So when something calls main, a stack adjust may take place. And by the way, that would be up here. Um, call main. I should have said um, sub stack pointer main caller stack adjust immediate. It's zero, but if I don't want to be smart, it needs to be there because the table is what will say it's zero. And then add stack pointer up here. Okay, so whoever calls main, I'm not too sure who that is, the operating system, um, is going to set aside room for main's parameters and presumably fill them in. There's no parameters to fill in, so there's no code there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that in even if it's zero. So make no extra room on the stack. Take the no extra room back off the stack as soon as the call finishes. Um, back to mains table. Okay, so that's zero. We should get the right thing done there. Um, yeah, my, my lineup got off here, which is unfortunate. Okay, so uh, for main, main's table for when it's running, um, it has, what does main have? It has a Y and a Z. So let's say main Y and main Z. It doesn't have an A. It doesn't have a return value. It'll never use that. Um, it does have a stack adjust. Okay. When main gets called, it needs to make room for two local integers, Y and Z. Um, stack adjust is four. Foo stack adjust for local vars, which are Y and Z. And where are these things? Put either one on the top of the stack, put the other one under it. I'm just going to say Y is equate zero and Z is equate two. Um, local variable Y, local variable Z. To access. Well, that's mains table. Very simple because it had no parameters and no return value but it does have the two local variables that it's gonna to need to access. One of them will be at the top of the stack. The other one will be right under it. And that's a total of four bytes that main needs to deal with when it gets started. Let's start the main table or the main program, main. That's the entry point. Adjust the stack. So subtract stack pointer, main stack adjust, immediate mode. room on stack for Y and Z. And if we think ahead just a little bit, let's go, let's actually make it right this time. Um, when I'm done down here, it will be add stack pointer, same amount, stack adjust, immediate. Remove Y and Z from stack. Okay, so calling it, um, there's the header. I think I need to execute z equals one next. That's gonna produce, uh, that's just a load. So LDA um, into, see the only way I can put a one into z, there's no direct approach. I have to load a one into the accumulator and then store it in z. So load um, one, immediate mode, store accumulator into Z, main Z, stack relative. That takes care of Z equals one. Before I do these two, um, I do want to point something out to you here. Where did it go? Up in 
in uh, foo. If you look at this for a minute, um, I calculated a plus three and put it into x. The last thing was store accumulator into x. The value of x is still in the accumulator. Okay. First thing I do next is load x in order to store it into the return value. Um, this could be optimized out. There's the compiler might say, you know what, whenever I get here, there's already an X in that, in that accumulator. Why bother loading it again? Okay. We have optimizing compilers. They try to do smart things to remove steps that don't technically need to be there. If you translate each command, literally, you end up with these extras that aren't absolutely necessary. Um, good compiler can get rid of them. On the homework, I'm going to have you write a piece of code like this. And it, it's written in the homework statement, do not optimize. In other words, I want you to do the direct translation without looking for things that can get left out. Okay, it's one of the biggest problems I see in, in this homework when I'm grading it is students, I don't think you're intentionally optimizing against my will. I think it's just that, you know, just in the back of your head, you know the value's there, so it doesn't occur to you to load it again. Do each step one at a time. What does this step, if I have return X, you gotta load the X to do it. Do not take into account context of what may have happened before. Okay, so anyway, we're down here. Uh, we did the z equals one. Now we're gonna do the y equals foo x and the c out of y. I'm gonna do c out first because it's easier and I'm lazy. Um, now obviously, in, in real life, c out is, is, a, is a, a, a class and there's all kinds of stuff going on here. Um, there's an overload, it's a function call. Tons of stuff happening here. I'm gonna do this for the purpose of this example, just using the output of the machine language. I need to get y and I need to output it. And so uh, getting y, load accumulator, um, main y, stack relative, all the variables in main, whether they be parameters or local variables or return value are stack relative because that those tables define those constants relative to the top of the stack. Okay, load the, load the y and then uh, output it. And we have this wonderful little command over here. We've been using character input and output which is wonderful, not. But um, there is another command here called decimal output. Ooh, you give it an accumulator, it actually writes out the whole freaking number in base 10. Uh, it says trap. And the reason it says that is because this is not a machine instruction. To output an integer, you have to repeatedly divide by 10 and, and isolate integer or isolate bits. There, there's a huge amount of stuff to do a real integer there. Um, turning each one into a character as you go. Uh, the way that works, I need to uh, find another uh, place to... Okay, let's go back to PEP8. Assembler, no. Did I put it in here? Nope. Did I put it there? Nope. Okay, I did put one out there for you in, in the, the other place, but for now I'll grab the one from the common memory map. Okay, it's in Pepe then. Memory map. I showed you this picture before. Come on. No! I hate Photoshop. Go away. And it takes so long for it to finish before I can shut it down. Come on, go away, go away, go away. Well, as long as it's here, we might as well look at it. Ooh. Okay, that's really scary. I can't point with that, it scares me. Um, let's see, let's open this with paint. Okay, so here's the memory map. All this code we're writing gets stuck in from zero down. That's where the assembler is going to put it. The user stack pointer top is initialized at FBCF. That's an empty stack. And as the op as our function, as our program runs and function calls happen and local variables are needed and stuff, that program, that, that user stack is going to move upwards and back down. Um, 
some of these instructions, the ones that say trap, decimal input trap, decimal output trap, string output trap, um, basically those are down in what's called a trap handler. Down here, there are, there's code for functions like the ones I just wrote, but they are functions for doing these operations. And basically the decimal input, what looks like an opcode, um, actually at the hardware layer, it's going to go out, jump to there, execute the code that does that, and then do a return from there. It's a completely separate command. It's not go. It's not to call subroutine. It's it's jump to uh, trap. I think is what it's called. And there's a return from trap. A few different things happen when you call a trap. But basically, all it is decimal input, decimal output, string output. They're functions defined down in here. They're built into the system. They're system services provided through programs. In real life, if you want a program to read something from the hard drive, um, your program sure as heck doesn't do it. Um, you execute something which ultimately is going to go to the operating system and say, hey, I need something from the hard drive. And the operating system has the code to do that. Um, I don't know what was funny. Okay, so um, probably making fun of Hester. Okay, so uh, keep that one around. Back to here. So I want to output Y. I'm just going to use the trap. Decimal out. D-E-C-O. And that'll give me, um, I want to output, guess what I want to output. Um, oh. Actually, that um, accesses memory directly. I didn't need the load this time. You don't output out of the accumulator. My bad. Decimal out uh, main Y. Uh, stack relative. That's a nice little command. Gets a lot done real fast. Okay, so that's not really what C out does, but for our purposes, I just wanted to have output happen so we can see the program actually does something if we're very, very lucky. Okay, now the function call. We're going to do the other end of that uh, thing we discussed. When A is running and it wants to call B, it needs to put values into the parameters for B, then adjust the stack over those, then call B. Right after the call, adjust the stack back and recover the return value. So let's walk through those things. Okay, so where we have Y equals foo Z, and then we have to catch the return value and stick it into Y. Okay, so... Um, Load in the accumulator. Let's do uh, Z first. Reality is in C++ and C, it usually does the parameters right to left, but there's no guarantee in the language definition that says which way it does it. Um, so load Z, stack relative, oh, I'm sorry, main Z, um, stack relative, and store in foo caller, what was that first parameter, A? I think they were A and B, stack relative. So main X stack relative, top of stack is here when main is running, it's gonna reach down and grab X into the accumulator and it's gonna stick it up into where A goes in the stack. Okay, um, stack relative always takes the value of the relative and adds it to the stack. There is no subtract and, and, and add stack relative. It's always additive. So when main is doing it, you need a negative number to get what you want. When you're looking down at your own stuff, it's a positive offset. Okay, and again, the adjustment of the stack offsets, that's a positive value, it's magnitude, which you're gonna add and subtract at different times. Okay, so this, these two um, are going to uh, place X into parameter A into foo's parameter A, place mains x into foo's parameter A. I'm gonna put this on the next line because that's where it actually really sort of happens. Okay, so we, we took care of, oh, mains z. Can't read my own uh, thing there. Now when I tried to run this through the, 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 the uh, assembler, it would have said unknown symbol 
because I don't have a main X up here. So that's main Z. Okay, load main Z, stick it into foos, colors A, and there should be one of those up there. Okay, next step is put that into the parameter B. So uh, load Is there an immediate mode load byte? R and all those A's. Yeah, I can do an immediate mode immediate load load byte. Immediate mode load byte. Okay, so L D B Y T E um, star and that is uh, immediate store byte. Um, into foos b variable from the caller's perspective, foo caller b, and that is always stack relative, place star into um, foos parameter z, a, and this one's b. Okay, um, in real life, of course, um, generally speaking, all of your machine instructions will move a word like the load does, um, or a byte like this one does. Anything bigger than, than a word, generally the compiler is gonna have to generate code in here to loop and transmit bytes at a time, um, which really slows your program down. The original version of C, um, you are not allowed to pass a parameter that was larger than an integer. Um, simply forbid it. Later versions of C, the ANSI standard, they, they added that in and allowed it, but it's, it's programmer be warned because that will slow your program. Your, yeah, when your program is running, passing large parameters and copying them is, is very, very slowing. Um, in your C++ classes, you learned about the reference parameter, which is a way to avoid that. The reference is one word. And so by passing a reference instead of the actual data, you don't copy all that stuff into parameters. Okay. So I've set up the parameter, I've set up the parameter. Um, I am going to call B. Um, foo. There isn't even a mode on that one. Um, I suppose you could say it's immediate, but um, you don't even have to say it. The, the assembler doesn't require it there. So that sort of speaks for itself. I don't think I can put anything into a comment. Before I call foo, main has to adjust the stack over the parameters. So this y equals foo has a number of steps. Load the parameters. Call the function with stack adjusts. So before the call, we will, um, Substack pointer foo caller stack adjust. I have to come up with these horrible names because I think I'm limited to eight characters here. That's immediate. Okay. Um, okay. Um, adjust stack or foo parameters and return value. Okay, then we call foo. Foo does its whole thing and when it's done, we're right back to here. And we gotta put that stack back the way it was. Add stack pointer. Oops. Foo caller stack adjust immediate. Put the stack back. So between here and here, the top of the stack is somewhere else and Foo is dealing with it. After this statement, we're back in main. The top of the stack is where it should be for main and main can then do something like this, accessing main's Y. Okay, where this call happens, the top of the stack is somewhere where nobody can access much of anything. The only thing that gets accessed there is the hardware. We'll add an item to the stack 
And when the return happens, it'll take it off. Okay, so that's the code for main. Um, well, I haven't done the return yet. Did main do a return? No, we just had um, shut down. So main is gonna get rid of its own local stack adjust, and then it's gonna shut down. Uh, return, I'm only gonna use return zero, not any of the fancy returns. Okay, that one in this particular example is gonna go all the way back to here, where we called main at the beginning. Uh, we're going to readjust the stack zero, and then the program will come to a stop. So this is the kind of bootstrap, the one that kicks the program going and starts calling main. Um, foo and main are both being treated as actual functions in this one. Uh, questions? Shall we try it? I, I give it about a 60 to 70 percent percent chance of working because there's a whole lot of places where we can screw this up. But let's let's give it a shot and see what happens. Um, okay, I'm gonna. Make that go away. I'm gonna make that go away for now. I'm gonna run pep8. I think I got one of those right here. Okay, this is a, oops, where did it go? This is assembler code. So I'm gonna copy this whole thing and put it up here. Okay, so all that stuff is up here. And again, like I said, I give it maybe 70% chance of working, probably less. I almost always screw something up somewhere. So let's try it. Um, assemble. Boom, it didn't work. So somewhere I should have uh, error messages. Oh, seriously? I got all the way to the end. That's sad. Okay, I'm gonna put it over here first because I wanna make sure that this thing works when it's finally done. Oh, main, code for main here. Um, I did that up above, hopefully. There's where main starts. Okay, the one that is just the name of the function all by itself, that's where the call is gonna to go to and that's where main starts executing. Okay, so after the return zero, that's the end of main. And I just have to shut things down here, dot end tells the assembler we're finished. Copy that, paste that over this one. I don't have all that extra junk there. I'm getting nervous. Okay, let's try assembling it again. Now that doesn't mean that everything was good in between because remember it does two passes through this thing. So it could be the first pass didn't find an end. So assemble. There we go, there's errors. Um, is that the first one? That's pretty good. Is that the only one? That's pretty good. Okay, L, D, B, Y, T, E. I forgot to specify whether there's the accumulator or the uh, other thing, the index register. So let's go find the load byte over here. Right there, load byte accumulator. I think that's the mnemonic. Um, Save. We can check our uh, Word document. L D B Y T E register. Okay, so we got that right now. Okay, so I don't know where that came from. Save as and just save. Really? I must have hit save as by mistake. Okay, so let's copy that, paste that into here, and uh, try it again. Assemble. Oh, really? What happened? Oh, build assemble. Okay, what happened? Is there an error I'm missing? It didn't produce object code. So there must be something wrong somewhere. Bottom right. Ah, thank you. Invalid mnemonic, store byte, same error. I forgot the A on it. OK, 
Okay, I'm always going to fix over here because I don't want to lose it. Stir by accumulator. Save it. That. Paste. And we'll try again. Yay! Okay, at least it assembled. And that's my entire program, which seems awfully short. Who knows? What was this program supposed to do? Uh, I, I don't think we ever actually sort of decided what should happen here. Um, could it be the wrong build? I don't know what that means. Oh, of the of the Pep8. Yeah, this is this is the older build, but it still basically works. Okay, so what did I do here? I passed a one and a star into foo. Inside foo, I took the one plus three, gives me four, stored it in X, I returned X. So it returned four. Um, down below, oh, I forgot the Y equals. When I got out of foo, I forgot to store the result into Y. So it would have outputted garbage. Um, just caught that. So let's go back to main and, and deal with the Y equals part. Main, okay, uh, y equals foo, that's the whole command. Load the parameters, call the function with stack adjusts. Um, and what we actually wanna do is, uh, I'm gonna put this as part of y equals. Um, so the y equals here, that's a part of main. Load main, store foo, call adjust. Okay, load the parameters, call the function. Okay, so right here, I should take that um, store return in Y. And that is gonna be load accumulator. Um, I need to get the return value from foo. Foo, from the caller's perspective, return value. Stack relative and store the accumulator into uh, Y, main Y stack relative. And decimal out goes straight to Y to do its job. Okay, let's save that. Okay, oh, it's so much bigger now. Uh, so yeah, what it should do, there was a, I think I decided there was a four coming out of, uh, of uh, foo, three went in, four came out, main is going to put the four into y and it's going to output y. With any luck, it should output a four. And I don't have to do any of that conversion stuff, that's what decimal out does. So we're looking for batch output four. Everybody cross your fingers and pray to whatever you pray to. Um, hope that's not offensive. Let's see, load it, okay, and execute it. And there's my four, yay! Wasn't that exciting? So this is how you do a function call. Um, it's very formula, formula, formulaic, is that the right word? Every function, you're gonna go through these same basic processes. You're gonna make the table for the thing that calls the function, you're gonna make the table for the function itself for those values it needs to access. The caller needs to access the parameters and the uh, return value. Um, parameters and return value. That's what it needs to be able to get at. And there's also the stack adjust in there. Um, plus stack adjust from the caller's perspective. When a function is running, it needs access to its local variables, it needs access to its parameters, it needs access to the return value when it's done, and of course it needs a stack adjust as well. Then we just start translating code. Um, the actual foo function starts, always put the locals on the stack. When you're done, remove them from the stack and return. Okay, in between, that statement turns into load, add, and store, uh, return x, load the x, store it in the return value, and we're ready to get out. So it's 
very formulaic here. The only thing that's going to change most of the time is these sort of internal commands. Now I gave you all of the, the parameter calling stuff. Um, questions? What chapter in the book does this refer to? All of them. Let me see. I have the table of contents way the heck in here. Writer language, instruction set architecture. That was what we did last time. Um, this is basically architecture and mostly assembly. I would say it's mostly the assembly, chapter five. Uh, now the thing is, chapter five simply tells you what each of these commands does. They don't really explain how to build up something that actually runs. That's what I did here. Okay, um, you know, they got a couple of examples in there. Um, they don't make the tables. They make it really hard to see what's going on. I've seen the output of compilers. The compiler outputs assembly code and the compiler outputs these tables and then uses the symbols for the remainder of the code in assembly. Um, I'm showing it to you that way so that you can see the process that a compiler would do. It's, it's a very predictable, very, well, you know, we had to be able to write a compiler. It can't be too complicated. So uh, primarily chapter five is, is the assembly stuff. Um, chapter six, let's see, uh, stack addressing and local variables, uh, branching instructions. Okay, now I, I do, oh, chapter 6.3, function calls and parameters. So yeah, five and six. Um, last week was five mostly, this week is, is more of the six stuff. Uh, we did not do dynamic memory allocation. Uh, we did not do arrays or uh, structures. Uh, class objects, containers. Um, basically, those are uses of the index register, and then I might next week, if I'm in a really good mood, um, look at those for just a couple of minutes. They're actually pretty easy compared to this. This is this is the worst it gets people. You're looking at it right now, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, mostly six, but you're probably going to want to give five a, a really good read before that, and if you have, if you're not comfortable with four yet, start there. It's 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 very much building on on the uh, the early. Okay, not so much four. That's that's the representations. Uh, where is the machine language? Oh, chapter four is computer architecture. Yeah. So four talks about how things work at the um, at the hexadecimal level. This stuff here. Five talks about this and six starts talking about how do you put it together into useful things. Other questions? Okay, we're getting near the end of the class. I want to wrap this up and talk about the homework a little bit. Um, let's keep that around for just a moment, just in case. So basically homework five, what I did here is I gave you a, a program and I want you to just walk through the same steps I did, just different variable names mostly. Um, you've got main, okay. I made a little put integer function, it receives a parameter and it outputs it. So you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna build a simple table for the parameter and you're gonna have an output that's gonna be a very short little function. Um, get integer, it's gonna perform input. For C input, use the decimal input. Okay, we're gonna we're not we're not gonna play around with those stupid conversion things anymore. Um, so decimal input for that input, uh, you got a local variable and a return value. That's all that's there. So you've got the basic structure calling. That's it. Um, the one thing that that is, I would say, new here, is that I did put a loop here. Okay, um, before I talk about the loop, let's look at the line inside. This is going to call get integer, which returns the value inputted. Put integer is going to um, take that value and output it. 
how is this going to work? You're in the loop for a moment. Okay. Um, the compiler is going to first call get integer, go do that, come back, recover the return value, just like we did with Y, and then immediately take that and place it into the parameter for put integer and call it. Okay. Your, your assemb the assembler code that you are the compiler, the assembler code you're going to produce calls that takes the return and pushes it straight into the parameter for push integer and calls push integer. Um, the one thing that you're actually gonna have to think about a tiny bit is that we know how the for loop works. You have a line that says I equals zero. You can do that. Um, you have plus plus I, which really goes after put integer. You can do that. I equals I plus one. This is the only difficult part or different new. And again, it's just, let's go back and look at it again. We have a command here somewhere. We decided it was down lower. Uh, compare. I've lost it again. CP. I can never find that one. So CPR, it compares the content of the register accumulator, CPA. It compares the contents against whatever the operand is. Okay, it performs a comparison. And then you have branch if any of the relationships that might occur. So for the loop, you're going to want to say if the, you know, um, one way to do this is calculate I minus three. Another way, which is more direct is um, put I in the accumulator and then compare it against an immediate three. That's what I would do. Load the I, compare immediate three. Okay. If it's less than, um, you do the loop again. So I'd actually, I would actually say branch if greater than or equal to, off the other end of the loop, past the end of it. Put a label. Um, so for, for this code here, just put a label end of for loop, and you'll have if i is greater than or equal to three, branch to end of for loop, and continue executing from there. So I'll let you work that loop out. Uh, chapter six goes through that kind of stuff. They probably even have an example of a for in there. I, I don't recall explicitly. But that's that's the one new part to this one. Otherwise, it's pretty much what we just did, just new new names. Questions? There's also another little teeny question up here, number 19. It's, it's a little chart in the book about, um, about you, you take a, a piece of source code and you compile it into object code and you link it into something else. There's a, there's a couple of steps that happen in there and they give you a table, they, they fill in some of the boxes and give you the English description of what's in those boxes. I want you to just follow that lead, fill in the remaining boxes, and give the English descriptions of the contents of those boxes. It's just describing the compilation process for a couple of programs. We're actually compiling a compiler in there, I think, which gets kind of funky to think about. If there are no questions, I'm done for the day. What time is it? 10.06. We finished five minutes early or something like that. Wow. I said not to optimize the code, correct. So each individual command, treat it as a separate issue, okay? If a value happens to end up in the accumulator at the end of a command and the next command says use that variable, load it again, okay? Because if, if you start walking down the road of optimization, you can do a lot of weird changes to this and I won't be able to figure out what the heck you did and certainly not whether or not it's right. Translate each line one at a time without any attempt to or actually attempt not to make assumptions about content. Can we see out the same way you did? Yes, C in, C out, just use the decimal and decimal out. It says that right here. Use decimal in and decimal out. Other questions? I want this to be as brainless as it can be. I don't want you to try to make it better. That's the whole idea here. Can we, see how, can we see how the same way you did? Yes. Are you going to post the text file you worked on? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Anything else? Where do I find the record video? Um, can I show you that? Let's give it a shot and see what happens. Um, OK. 
Okay, this is not, here's my Zoom. Maybe. Nope. I don't seem to have a Zoom running. Let's see if I can get a Zoom running. Okay, so I've got event recordings. Um, appointments, you've obviously figured out you're here. Under event recordings, you find the event. Um, that would probably be the uh, March 19th. Oh, they do it bottom up. I don't know that I've ever, I've seen two of them before. So let's check for recordings. Uh, let's go to the other one. I don't want to touch something that is actually recording at this moment. I, I just don't want to take my chances. So I'm going to go to last week and view the recordings. And this will probably take 10 minutes. Zoom is really way over uh, extended right now. Yeah, so you could watch the video as many times as you want. Come on. We're going to find about uh, seven or eight things in this list. Um, there's a streaming video. There is a video you can download. Um, there is uh, just an audio for streaming. There's an audio you can download. There is a textual transcript of, of the entire process, um, which is basically my voice being converted to text. And it's horrible to read because it basically, it says from Jim Hester for every sentence. It's, it's absolutely terrible. But you got a text version of it if you want it. Um, and there's also this chat um, without private conversation added, I believe. And so, uh, you know, if there's anything in here that you want to see, questions or whatever, you can do that too. I try to read the questions out loud whenever I answer them so that um, that would appear as part of the, the recorded transcript as well. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give up at this point. Basically, though, event recordings tab and then check for recordings. Give it a day or so. If, 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 it, if it says there aren't any, give it a day or so because it does take time for these things to appear. I think my record so far, one of them took about a day and a half to appear. Uh, usually they're within uh, like half an hour of, of the time they're made. But um, it's, again, Zoom is, is uh, horribly outstretched right now. The whole world is using it. And so, um, it appears that part of that is, is a manual process or something because it's so slow. I don't know how, what's going on there, but uh, that's how you do it. Other questions? Are you still doing participation by checking for anyone saying hi? I will be, yes. I've, I've messed around some more with the, uh, with the other things. You don't need to say hi today. The test is the hi. That's why I didn't ask you to. Um, that's going to be my attendance. Uh, if you didn't take the test, you weren't here. But um, presumably most of you took it. Um, yeah, the, the attendance that it takes, this, this event attendance thing over here, is extremely flaky. Um, I think part of the problem is that many of you are logging in from the link that you, you get an email invitation to these things the way I've scheduled it. And so you're coming in through the link and that doesn't necessarily list you as, as one of the invited attendees. It's some weird thing. Um, I just don't get them. They're empty or there's only one or two people in them. Um, many people, some of the teachers I've talked to, their solution is to say, they only allow you to come in through zoom. They don't send those, those link offers. And if they do that, um, you can't get into zoom. Sometimes I spent 15 minutes before a class trying to get in. And I finally gave up and, and came in through the, the little Zoom app, which works great for me. I don't know how well it works for you guys, but uh, if, if you go to that and you log in to your Zoom account, then I think it does recognize you when you when you connect. But it's all pretty iffy stuff. Um, the high things to be is the best. So yeah, not today, but but normally yes. Anything else? Otherwise, let's uh, go away for a while. Okay, got any more questions? Uh, you know where to reach me, um, Zoom, or excuse me, um, email, whatever. And um, we'll see how things go this week. Everybody take care, bye.
at six times share and meaning. 